We're going to move right into the program. I'd like to invite up my friend Alex Iwarte from American Express Open. Um, and she's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm going to do this super quick because we want to get Valerie up here. And she told me to let you know that boot camp means jam packed. And so it's going to be really jam packed. So she's going to be here all day to answer any questions you have. Um, just wanted to put that out there as she goes through her session. So Valerie Morris, four decade long career, CNN anchor. She has a radio show that still gets, goes out three times a week for the past 25 years. She is a financial expert. Um, she is here to teach you all about the incredible synergies between your success and your financial competency. And she is part of our American Express Open program, which is actually called a boot camp as well. We have a new program called CEO Boot Camp. It is a fantastic initiative for women entrepreneurs to help you think and act more like a CEO to grow your business. So we invite you to check out our website, openforum.com backslash CEO Bootcamp. You'll hear insights from some of our phenomenal um, women like Valerie speaking on various topics. So Valerie is going to give you a taste of our, our Bootcamp and we thank Digital Undivided so much for having us here today. Valerie. Perfect. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Are you ready? Okay, got a little bit more energy going here. As we said, it is going to be very packed, but I want to make sure you know that I will be here the entire day. I wouldn't want to miss this. So even though I would normally do questions and answers afterwards, because our time is so short, and we started a little bit late, so we're just going to proceed. Are you ready? All right. It is very important if you notice on your tables you have this booklet, Harnessing the Power of Money. This will uh, compensate a lot of what I would normally be talking about if I had a little bit more time. This booklet will help you immensely. This was produced by American Express Open for Women for our boot camp, and I will be talking points from this. You know, an entrepreneur really is someone who risks everything every day. And this is the goal of this boot camp of harnessing the power of money is to help you lower your risks and to help you elevate your chance of success. Here's the reality. Businesses fail for the same reason marriages do. Not talking about money. Money is the single most important issue when it comes to divorce. And that's the reason why that when we talk about harnessing the power of money, we talk about it from your personal money and your business money as well. Whatever point you are in your business at this time, just pause for a moment and realize what's in it for you personally. Just think for a moment. Is it that you are just starting your business and you have a certain age that you want to stop working? Is it perhaps a certain outcome or a turning point? I run my own business in that I provide content and distribution to outlets. I create syndication deals because of my radio programming. And I have ongoing relationships with domestic and international clients. Having been a broadcast journalist for more than 40 years, and most recently the domestic and international business anchor for CNN, these are my acquired skills. Do you have some of these skills? Observation, initiation, listening, planning, implementation, execution, I see some people nodding their heads. Those are the skills with which I'm going to discuss today, the basics of harnessing the power of money. I always say to women, please drop the word balance. Because when's the last time you've had a 50-50 day? Work, family, exactly balanced. Instead, I like to bring back a term and say integrate. Integrate your work and your life your family, because that's the only way that you can really stay sane and feel like, yes, I can get this done, understanding that some days it's going to be 80-20. Some days it may get close to 50-50, but it is not a goal. When you start your business, there is certainly a vision about how it's going to be and how you're going to make money. But there is very little focus on an exit strategy. How many of you have an exit strategy? How is this going to end? How you see yourself exiting your business is how you build your business up front. 
your exit strategy has a lot to do with and must be part of how you manage money within your business. So how you see yourself exiting your business is how you build your business up front. So let's talk about a three-legged stool because that's a strategic plan. There are three legs. One is the financial leg. This is basically the question, do you have the money to finance your business? When I talk about personnel and talent, choose well. And especially if you are bringing in family members, which is a whole workshop I do in and of itself, <laughs> be very careful and choose well and make sure that you have defined, clear job description and expectations. The third point of the strategic plan is intangibles. And by that, I mean what goodwill do you have and relationships in place in the market that will support your business. So remember, the strategic plan should be reviewed monthly or quarterly because the strategic plan is the Bible to your business. Just always remember that when it comes to money, Women must be far-sighted, start saving early, and stick to our money plans. Do you realize that women, we are nearly half the total workforce. Our incomes have soared 63%. 51% of all managerial uh, workers and professional workers are women. Women bring in half or more incomes in most US households. Women-owned businesses equal 40% of all companies in the United States, and yet, as we look on, do women feel secure or insecure regarding their personal money? Uh, only in the survey, sorry, let me just go back one. When you came in, uh, you were handed a piece of paper asking do you feel secure or insecure? It was very interesting because the number of you here who feel secure, 17, only three feel insecure and only one is undivided. I'd really like to have conversations with you about why you feel so secure, because 90% of women surveys do not feel secure. In fact, only 10% of women say they feel extremely financially secure. One of the most stunning outcomes of this survey that was done by Age Wave was the discovery of an irrational fear, is what they called it, that extends to women all across all corners of life and affluence. Almost half of all women who responded say they often or sometimes fear losing all of their money and becoming homeless. So consider yourself exceptions or consider the fact that maybe security isn't what you thought it was. The state of your personal finances, even though you feel secure, the state of your personal finances can impact the businesses that you're trying to grow. The weakness in people's stewardship of personal money always carries over to managing your business money. 87% of entrepreneurs are solopreneurs. How goes their business goes their household. Some of you in this room may have already dipped into 401ks or retirement savings in order to start your businesses. There are other options, and I will discuss those shortly. I want to tell you just a quick story, first of all. It's called The Rearview Mirror, and in my book I talk about it a lot. I'm an Air Force kid. I was raised England, France, Scotland, and Japan by the time I was a junior in high school. If you're a military kid, you either love it or hate it. There is no middle. I loved it. And my father always used to say whenever I was challenged, he'd say, Valerie, why does a car have a rearview mirror? And I knew the answer, so you know where you come from. My dad would then say, that's right, but what happens if you look in the rear view mirror for too long? What do you think the answer was? He wasn't talking about having an accident. He said, be careful. If you look in the rear view mirror for too long, you won't know what you run into. He was talking about opportunity. So part of the reason that women have a problem is that we often look at money with a rear view mirror look. This is what I've lost, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? Do you handle your money or does your money handle you? It's part of the reason if you look on the table, there is also a sheet there that's a genome sheet that I hope you will take the time today to fill out so that you can understand where your money habits come from, how you form them, and from whom. Because the reality is it will help you discover patterns of influence that have led you to think about and spend money the way you do, either personally or professionally. Forward-thinking women. 
women who are not doing the rear view mirror view are the influencers in their families and in the world of business. Personal money management is our responsibility. And remember, money has no conscience. It depends on yours. I always say to African American women, black is beautiful, but being in the black is necessary. Entrepreneurism is certainly a high wire act. The CEO is on the high wire and really has no safety net. You don't have an automatic income, no 401k. These things don't exist, so how do you create a financial safety net? It's a combination, but it starts with what do you want to look like? Build yourself that way early on. But the direct answer to this question, how do you create a safety net, is to hire a CFO because your chief financial officer is the net. Remember that CEOs are not CFOs. CEOs need to understand the responsibilities of the CFO, but identifying and finding this person who can help you plug the dike in your business should be your goal. When we talk about CEOs as visionaries, this is where, when, how you want to take your business. You're understandably less focused on the financial, so please find that competent CEO. Decide your aim for your business. This is one of the things that a CEO needs to do. Where do you want to take your company? Use Fortune companies that specialize in consulting and guidance services to help you determine this. Make sure that you do research with similar businesses. You understand I use the word similar businesses, not competition. You are looking at businesses that are within your area of concern. There is no such thing as a business that doesn't have some form of competition, but learn from similar businesses' successes, but more importantly, from their failures. Make sure that you create the company vision and set a path. It's also important that you schedule time for strategic planning. Always keep your financial team in the loop to help drive your business and support your vision for growth. I'm gonna outline shortly for you what should comprise your financial team. But hold scheduled periodic financial reviews when the team can present a summary of your company's financial health. Keeping your company and your staff informed is more than just sending out a company email once a week. Consider the company vision, the mission, and the legacy, and how that translates to growth for the next three years. Make sure that you also strategize to reach specific three-year goals. Notice the word goal comes up repeatedly because the goal is what drives you to a conclusion. Translate your strategic plan into one-year tactical game plan to meet very specific goals. These goals, by the way, should be goals that are already identified and specified in your business plan. Strategic planning determines the necessary financial investments for reaching goals. Now, getting close to the numbers, that's another thing that we, you will read in the book that Amex has provided harnessing, the goal, harnessing your money. Getting close to the numbers. For any CEO, the only number that really matters is profit before and after taxes. Now, when you put your business plan in place, it should specifically speak to profit. Everything must align with a profit. Employees can talk about revenue, but you, as the CEO, need to talk about profits, which expand and let you invest in your business. You need to also recognize and watch, once again, similar businesses, because their challenges, and most importantly, look at their profitability. In other words, learn from someone else. And if you are feeling lost about these key numbers that you need to focus on, look around this room. Make contact with other women entrepreneurs and understand that this room is a gathering that is building an online community for women business owners. Often, I would like to say, women tend to be driven by the idea and the impact that we can make because that's our nature. Men are more bottom line. It's what kind of money am I going to make on this deal? My husband is always fond of saying, if we're going somewhere, I'll say, well, stop for directions, honey. And he will declare, I'm not lost. I'm just not where I'm going yet. 
<laughs> that is the mentality in business that men have, and women must have a similar approach. Men and women have different points of focus by which they run their business, but let me tell you, all financing, whether it is a loan, a partner, going public, all financing focuses on how you've got there and how the bottom line can be influenced after taxes. So, how can a CEO stay on top of ensuring the financial health of their business? Stay educated, classes, workshops, conferences, executive MBA courses, a mentor, and especially online, because then things are right at your fingertips. You're going to be able to get the information that you need and that information immediately. When we now talk to how you find opportunity, it is also by making sure that you think about a financial team, AKA your safety net. So a CFO, a CFO is the person who participates in and enhances the strategy development and implementation. Your CEO, my strong suggestion to you, should be a person who has come out of your vertical. In other words, your category of trade. They will then know the metrics of measuring your category of business. This person, I feel, should already have the knowledge your company needs because you cannot afford their learning curve. Your accountant or controller, this is the person who keeps you informed of the past, present, and future financial health of your business. Your tax advisor, the tax advisor provides your insights, advice, solutions on your tax matters. We have already talked about your business financial advisor. That is, of course, your CFO. Now let's talk about the board, because the board should have at least one member with a strong financial background. Ideally, this background should be in your category of trade, and ideally, they should have a proven record. Do your due diligence to make sure that the person can perform on your board and in your space. And finally, your personal financial advisor helps you to develop and execute your personal financial plan in sync with your financial business plan. Coordinate, I would suggest, meetings between your CFO and your personal CFO, if you will, your chief financial officer of your life. Because whenever you have a major life-changing event, uh, birth, death, marriage, divorce, relocation, you need to recalculate your relationship with your money on both sides, your business and your personal. And these two things need to be managed in concert. I did not say the money needs to cohabitate, but you need to understand from both sides what is happening. Numbers. I want you to just look at this for a moment because a number is what drives everyone to a goal. If you have saved no money at all and you are 25 years of age, in order to have a million dollars, by the age of 65, and this is considering that nothing is taken out, no withdrawals, that you have saved nothing yet, and that it's earning an annual of about 8%. You would need to save $286 every month if you were 25. You would need to save $671 10 years later. If you have nothing saved at the age of 45, you would need to save $1,698 a month. And if you are 55, you would need to save nearly $5,500 every single month to reach this goal. Understanding that you can catch up, you can try and accommodate, but here is the number. I wanted to make sure that you have a number for your goal. It is very important. At this moment, if we could pause, just so we can talk about how you reach numbers every day. You see a little book, little blue book that's there? I have my own, it happens to be a little purple book, and this is an absolute true story. On Saturday, I was out with my husband. I got very ill, and by the time we got home, I still was feeling awful. I was literally sick all weekend. On Monday, life is back together. I go to get my purse. My wallet is missing. The way that I was able to recreate it, oh yeah, I made all the calls, because I have from my wallet, and I hope that each of you will today, promise that as soon as you leave and you get next to a copy machine, copy the contents of your wallet front and back. Because if you ever lose it, that is one way that you can get it back, the information back. As I called my various cards, and they were saying, well, ma'am, we have to have a way of knowing, you know, this is you, here are some 
expenses, can you tell them? I was able to say yes on the 9th of September. I was at Safeway grocery store. I spent X amount of dollars. They said, well, what about on the 30th? Did you buy anything? Yes, and I was able to tell them exactly. Because the little blue book that you have, here's mine. And in it is my simple budget. Everything I spend, I write down. Whether it is 75 cents for a pack of gum, if you can find it that cheap, or whether it is rent. So what I'd like you to do for one minute now is to take out that little book and write down just yesterday's date and what you spent yesterday, whatever it was. Was it online for your rent, your mortgage, a car payment, insurance, whatever you spent yesterday. If it was just normal things, it was just lunch, how much was lunch? Did you pay by debit? Did you charge it? Did you pay cash? So write that down for yesterday and then today. Just take that moment. Because in my book, everything is down. And this is my rescue point. What you're doing now is a simple exercise called creating a personal budget. So from today forward, for one month, if you can write down everything you spend, just the date, the amount, and from what source. At the end of a month, highlight the mandatory expenses. We all know what are mandatory expenses, right? Call some out. What are mandatory expenses? Rent. What else? Food. What else? Transportation. Insurance. Whatever. Highlight those mandatory expenses. Whatever is not highlighted, total that amount. That's your discretionary spending. So that if you say, but I need an extra $100 to do, you can now go back to this book, understand where can you take $100? Do you get one of those great vanilla lattes every day, $4.25, five days a week? How much is that? If you need money, you can find it here. Remembering the Genome handout, the one that I said tells you about your personal money habits, Money habits, good or bad, are learned early and they tend to last a lifetime unless intervention of the bad or recommitment of the good. So use this handout to discover the patterns of influence that have led you to think and spend money the way you do and then plan to recalculate your money habits and your thoughts. Now to recalculate your business growth potential habits and thoughts, you must seize the opportunity, always. Opportunities. Opportunities narrow the gap towards your vision, but evaluate financial implications of every decision. Because remember, all that glitters is not gold, so you must go through this kind of process to determine what's truly of value. Make sure that you weigh the personal and business trade-offs for every new opportunity to ensure a good strategic fit. Use analysis, analysis such as cost-benefit, return on investment, and net present value, which is the company profits after taxes, to separate what is seemingly a good deal from that which is actually a great opportunity. The biggest error that most small business owners make is that they don't do ongoing research and stay in touch with their market. I think this audience stays deeply in touch because you don't want any divide. It's a, a reminder, though, that businesses need to refocus all the time. Sometimes this error gets lost in the shuffle of day-to-day -day business. Funding the growth knowledgeably and deliberately. By that I mean cash from operations may not always be enough to make your growth-oriented changes. You want to grow, and you think you have enough to finance that. The problem is that when you start taking from the profits to put into your growth strategy, it can compromise your core business that created the profits in the first place. Because directing money from profits to pay for something that is brand new, therefore carries a risk. The reality is, sometimes you need a loan. And when you get money from somewhere, just remember, you must service the source. Let's talk about finding money. Let's start with loans, which is the money that is given with interest, charged, and a set payback time frame.
The advantages are there is no equity sacrifice, the loans are tax deductible, and there are set payments that help with expense management. The disadvantages, loans can be difficult to secure and to qualify for. They require set payback time frame. The debt can be dissuading future investors or lenders. The payback issues can have personal consequences because you may in fact have to put up personal capital. So those are loans. Moving on to grants. This is money that is typically given without need for payback and it's given through public and private ent uh, entities. The advantage is obviously no payback is required. The disadvantage can take a tremendous effort to find and to apply for and to qualify for. Equity
risks and money, but when it gets to that next level, just consider, you know, here's the ground floor, then you go up and it's that mezzanine level and you look out and you can see things. It gives you a better vision. It just means that it's an opportunity to elevate your business even more. There are some people who do not like to invest in startups. They just feel that it's just too risky. But if you get to the mezzanine, they start saying, hmm, this has some potential, so let's take another look. As far as this, how do you know if it's someone who's only acting like they're going to help you? It's part of the reason that a community of business entrepreneurs is so important. Ask other women ask friends, make those relationships so that you can vet people. You know, I mean, the internet is there. Don't ever do business with someone if you don't know who they are, their company, read some backgrounds, find out if there have been any negatives uh, said about them, and the positives, because you want to know that as well. The most important thing is that so often women, we're so loyal, and we'll say, well, but this person said they do. We have to do more like the male counterpart and make sure this is really going to be worthy. This is worth our time, our effort. Oftentimes, I've been in meetings with men, and an idea will come into the conference room. And men will just say, well, we'll do that later. You know, women will tend to say, OK, let me just see what it is so I can figure out where it needs to go. Let me jam it in. Let me put it in. We can't do that. We have to take a little bit more time. I always say breathing is really good, because sometimes before you do something, take just that good, deep, cleansing breath, and you open your eyes and you may see it just a little clearer. Making sure that we don't feel like, if I check up on somebody, maybe they won't like me, maybe they will feel that I don't trust them. No, you're just doing good business. You are checking all the boxes and making sure that this person who is saying they would like to help you, why? Investors invest not just to be good. Investors invest so that you can pay them back with profit and with interest. So that's what I would say on there. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you were talking about the intangibles of strategic planning. I would love to hear you expound more on the kinds of things that people should be thinking about in that category, what they leave out. And if people are writing a first strategic plan, what's a good source for them to look at to think about how it should look? Uh, the strategic plan, first of all, there's so many of them. They're available online. They're available through affinity groups, uh, trade associations. I also think that's a hugely important business asset to make sure that you know what your trade groups are, because that's part of the intangibles. Um, this is Karen Palmer, a friend of mine. We were at CNN together, one of the best creative people I know. And when, as booker and producer, one of the things you know we all, you would always have to do is make sure how much information can the anchor absorb in order to do a good interview you know, with this individual. Consider yourself a reporter all the time on your own behalf. Look for the research. Do you see other people who are running businesses, other women, and you say their business just seems to glide. It's just so smooth. It's so clear. Call them. Everyone loves the stroke. You are fabulous. I love the way that you run your business. Could we just have some time together? And wh here's what I can do for you. I'm really good at doing this or that. So bartering is part of the system that women need, understanding who the experts and the specialists are, not being afraid to contact people and say, I'm on a need-to-know basis. So this is the reason I always like to end with this, because far too often, if you are anxious about the business and what you're doing, it's like, anybody? Anybody ready to help? Anybody may not be the right answer. Remember, it's your business. It's your money. Take it personally and know you can reset your sales. Thank you all. I think my time is up. But I am here all day long and would love to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much again. Thank you.